everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Danielle Cousset. I'm a guidance counselor here at Hampton Hills High School. I am happy to let you all know that we have Danielle Haft here tonight. She's from SUNY Albany. She will be speaking with you first, and then you'll hear from the guidance counselors. So. Hi, everybody. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Good, good. And hi to everybody who's tuning in remotely. Uh, my name is Danielle Haft. I'm from the University at Alpe. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the college application process. So just by a show of hands, who's excited? No one's excited. Okay, a few. We've got a couple. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to pop this out over here so I can walk around a bit. All right. So... Uh, tonight, like I said, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the college admissions process. And um, just by another quick show of hands, I'm assuming everyone in the audience is either a junior or a parent of uh, a child that is in 11th grade, correct? Yes, for the most part. Maybe some sophomores, early eager people. That's okay. But anyway, we're going to talk a little bit more about preparing for the college admissions process. Um, just to kind of start us off. Um, just a little bit of an agenda for what I, I'm going to be discussing. We're going to talk a little bit more about the University of Albany, specifically um, where I work in the admissions office. Then we're going to talk a little bit more about the actual application. We'll go into some, some of the terminology. And then we'll take a little bit more of a deeper dive into the different applications, how you can kind of um, navigate those, what some of the deadlines are, and some of the different pieces as it pertains to the actual applications. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the essay. I know Ms. Crusay is going to be talking a little bit more in depth about the essay in her portion, so we won't do too much of a deep dive into that, but we'll touch on it just a little bit. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about campus visits and uh, touring the campuses and how to make the most out of visiting colleges, meeting with admission staff and meeting with uh, professionals on a college campus just so you can get familiar uh, before making your decisions and before actually applying to those colleges. Um, and lastly, we'll talk a little bit more about some just general tips for success. And then of course, if anyone has questions at the end of my portion or um, at the end, happy to uh, address some of those as well. Sound good? All right, so we're gonna dive into this a little bit more. So as I said, uh, we're gonna do a little bit more of an uh, overview about the University at Albany. Uh, so U Albany is part of the SUNY system, and SUNY is a system of public higher education, particularly within New York State. Um, other states have their own systems, uh, like California, for example, or uh, Florida, uh, but New York has the SUNY system. They also have the CUNY system as well, not to get too into the weeds, but SUNY is the state university system. And within SUNY, there's 64 colleges and universities. Um, you have some that are smaller community colleges, like for example, Suffolk Community College. Um, then you have more uh, smaller colleges, which we call comprehensive colleges, like uh, SUNY Oneonta, or New Paltz, or Cortland. Um, and then we have larger universities, so like the University of Albany or Stony Brook University, for example. So U Albany is pretty unique. Um, we aren't too big of an institution, but we aren't too small either. We have about 13,000 undergraduate students. So as you begin to navigate the college admissions process and start making your list, which I'm sure Ms. Crusay will talk a little bit more about in just a few minutes, is uh, narrowing down what kind of size of a population you want to immerse yourself in when you go to a college. Some students are like, I want to be at a college that has 500 students or less. And some students say, no, I want to be with thousands and thousands of students. And some students say, I want to kind of meet in the middle. So narrowing that down is important, um, but as we're talking about you all me specifically, we have about 13,000 undergraduate students. So we like to say we're not too big and we're not too small. Now when it comes to some of our academic rigor and what sets us apart is we are what we call a research one university. Now colleges and universities all across the country are given distinctions by how much research is produced on their campus not only by their students, but also by their faculty and their professors. So here at UAlbany, um, we are considered a research one university, 
which actually classifies us in a, with about 130 other colleges across the country. What that really means is that our professors and our faculty are doing their own research in addition to teaching their classes. So when things like COVID happened, uh, our School of Public Health was doing unique research about how we navigate a global pandemic. And so different research um, is happening every single day across our campus, which ultimately boils down to our students and how they're learning in the classroom, which really does make us pretty unique. Now, as it pertains to our class sizes, average class size is about 31 students. Depending on their major, um, they might have some larger class sizes, like if you're a psychology major, you might be in a lecture hall, probably similar to this size room that we're sitting in right now. But if you are maybe an environmental science major, one of our smaller majors on campus, you might see your classes dwindle a bit. But on average, our class size is about 31 students. And as it pertains also to our academics, we have about 50 undergraduate majors and 70 undergraduate minors that span across nine schools and colleges across the university. Our largest college is our College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, the College of Arts and Sciences houses programs like biology, sociology, psychology. Um, we also do have other colleges like our Rockefeller College of, uh, Public, of Criminal Justice and Public Policy. Um, School of Education and School of Public Health, just to name a few. But UAlbany does pretty much have any and all programs you are interested in, so if you do have more specific questions about the programs that we offer as it gets closer to the time of application, feel free to uh, let me know if you have any more specific questions. And lastly, one of the things that sets us apart as an institution is what I always like to save uh, for last is really our location. So from here in Hampton Bays, we're probably about four hours or less away from Albany. And really one of the nice benefits of UAlbany is that, of course, we are a SUNY school, so you are getting a pretty decent bang for your buck in terms of tuition. We are significantly less expensive than some private schools, but you are still having the benefits of being in a hustle and bustle area. Our campus, though, is not downtown in Albany. We're actually nestled in more of a suburban area, but that actually has a lot of advantages to our students as well. It's a very similar area to where you're used to growing up in here in Hampton Bays, um, but students are still able to take advantage of internships and part-time job opportunities while they are a student at UAlbany. So there's definitely a lot of what we call applied learning opportunities as well. So that's a little bit more um, just about UAlbany in general and a little bit more about um, our location and our academic uh, programs that we offer. At this time, I am going to kind of transition to talk a little bit more about generally how we can kind of navigate the college admissions process um, from, from your perspective. So as we kind of dive into things, there's a lot to dissect when it comes to the college admissions process. So starting kind of from the very beginning is there are, there are different, there's different terminology as we look at college admissions and when we look at the actual applications. So typically students are going to apply for college in their senior year. Usually they'll start thinking about the application though toward the end of their junior year. So if you're a junior right now, this is kind of a perfect time to just begin getting your feet wet and exploring what some of your options are. As you kind of approach the summer and the beginning of the fall is actually when you're going to be start preparing your applications. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But as it pertains to the actual terminology, there's different points in time where you can actually submit an application for admission to a college. Now just to kind of dissect these a bit further, if we talk about early decision, which is actually listed on the first bullet on the slide, early decision means that you as the student is making a binding agreement with the college that if you get admitted, you do have to go there. Um, what I will say, kind of the caveat about early decision, is that not many schools offer early decision. Some do, but we are seeing less and less colleges offer early decision because, like I said, it is a binding agreement between the student and the college that if they are admitted, they do have to go there. 
Um, sometimes there is some wiggle room with the financial piece, but most of the time, again, you are making that binding agreement with the college. From our perspective, um, there are some advantages and disadvantages when it comes to early decision. So usually when I'm talking to parents I do, and students alike, I do like to recommend early action, which is listed right below early decision, is usually a better option. Most schools that offer early decision will offer early action. At UAlbany, we don't offer early decision, we only offer early action um, and what we call regular admission. So early action is a little bit different than early decision. Early action means that you are just submitting your application earlier, which means that you as the student get a decision earlier from the college. So for example, this year, um, our early action deadline was November 15th. So as long as you as the student sent in your application on or before November 15th, you were guaranteed a decision from us by January 1st. Now, some of the advantages to that is that as a student, you have more time to weigh your options when it comes to choosing a college. So if you want to uh, visit the college or you know apply to some other colleges in the interim before you have to decide where you're going That kind of gives you that time as well um, The only disadvantage I would say with early action is that if you as the student or as the parent of a, of a student Needs more time to get your application in it does kind of shorten that time frame a little bit So that's why preparing over the summer and in the early fall is kind of important now, if you do need that extra time, like let's say you're having a tough time meeting that November de deadline or December deadline, you can always apply regular admission, which means that usually the application deadline would be sometime in January or February. And the reason why I'm saying usually or kind of just guesstimating is that as you'll notice, every college that you are going to apply to will have a different timeline. Now I know as the student and as the parents, that really doesn't make it easy for you um, because you are kind of trying to keep up with all these deadlines and they are different based off of the college. But that's why it's really important to kind of keep yourself organized. So a lot of times what I recommend is keep a Google Doc or keep a notebook and make different columns of when each deadline is for each of the schools you are applying to, to really just kind of keep yourself organized throughout the process. So that's a little bit more about uh, those deadlines. The last thing I'll mention is that sometimes colleges will offer something called rolling admission. That really means that you can kind of just apply at any point and depending on their admissions office, they might have a one week turnaround time or they might have a one to two month turnaround time. So again, it really does depend on the specific college that you are going to be applying to. Now next we're gonna talk a little bit more about the actual application types. So again, kind of going along with the theme, this is going to vary between any college that you are applying to. I'll kind of start it off easy though. Most colleges nowadays utilize something called the common application. So in this case, it actually makes it easy for the student because you can most of the time apply to all of the colleges that you are going to be applying to using one application. And I'm sure, you know, as you kind of get into your senior year and the end of ju your junior year, you're going to start utilizing the common application more and learning more about it. But typically, the common application will have most uh, colleges on it. Um, and again, you can utilize that one application and apply to all of the colleges that you are interested in. Sometimes though, if you might have one college that will require something extra that the other college didn't, and that will just differ slightly. But it, it is very user-friendly to utilize the common application. The other application is the SUNY application. That is specific to the SUNY system. So if you know as a student, I only want to apply to SUNY schools, then maybe the SUNY application will be a better fit for you. Um, usually I tell students that if they're interested in applying to maybe three SUNYs and two out-of-state schools and two private schools, the common application is a little bit of a better fit. But again, if you know I only want to apply to SUNY schools, then the SUNY application will be a, bit, a little bit of a better fit for you. 
There are some other different types of applications. We have the coalition application, which is a little bit more common with like schools in, uh, out west. They utilize the coalition application or more private schools will utilize this. And then sometimes you'll actually see schools have their own application. Um, so for example, Siena College, which is also located in the Albany area, I believe they actually have their own application. I think it's called the Siena application. So that's the only application that they have. They might also be on the common application as well, uh, but they do also offer their own application. So those are when we see like school specific applications. Now, as we kind of talk a little bit more about the actual application process, one of the most common questions that we get asked on the admission side is how does my application get reviewed? And I think that's probably the most burning question for students and families because it's kind of like the unknown, right? You're putting your application out there and you're hoping that one or more, people, more colleges say yes to you for you to be granted admission. So what I will say is, of course, my perspective is really from New Albany and how we do our admissions process, but I do feel like it is relative to other colleges out there as well because we are pretty consistent across the board. Now, most colleges, when you are applying for admission, the number one thing that they are going to look at is your high school transcript because realistically and academically speaking, that's going to be the biggest indicator of how academically you're going to succeed at their institution. Now GPA wise, just speaking for you Albany for a second, our median range, which means the middle 50% of students that are accepted for admission into U Albany, typically fall between like an 89 and a 94. That's usually our middle range. For other schools, it might be a little less, and for more competitive institutions, it might be higher. So that's why it's important to utilize um, Naviance or um, all of the different preparation tools out there to be able to kind of put yourself on the map and see where you might have the best chances. And that's something that you'll want to talk about with Ms. Rousse or your other guidance counselors is kind of mapping out where do you fit with other colleges based on your academic performance. Now, of course, in, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. yeah, yeah, also, and uh, Ms. Crusade just mentioned that inside your folder, there is a SUNY Albany um, admissions profile. So, so oh, yes, yeah. oh, all the SUNY. So you can reference that as well if you have questions about that it covers GPA and everything. Okay, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about other SUNYs and their admissions criteria, that is in the blue folder that you got when you checked in. Um, and probably also available online, just in case if you misplace that. Uh, so in addition to the transcript review, when we are going through the admissions process, there are other things that we look at uh, when you are applying for admission. Of course, one of the big things that we are going to take into account is letters of recommendation. So that's also going to vary between colleges, but at UAlbany, we typically recommend one to two letters of recommendation. Now traditionally, one of those letters of recommendation will come from someone like your guidance counselor, and then another letter of recommendation will come from a teacher um, of any subject. But usually we recommend the core courses, which would be social studies, math, English, science, language. Um, again, this will vary between colleges, but most of the time across the board, we see colleges requiring anywhere between one to three letters of recommendation. Of course, you as the student are more than welcome to get additional letters of recommendation, but from our perspective, when we're reviewing applications, I wish we had all day to read through all of the pieces of your application, and we do do a thorough review, but just for example, this year with you all these admissions process, we received over 30,000 applications for admission, and that's just so far. We're not even done yet. So, you know, we're reading 100 to 200 applications a day per person. So if you have five, six, seven letters of recommendation, sometimes we don't get to spend that quality time reading every single one of them. So sometimes when it comes to letters of recommendation, less is more when it comes to the review process. 
Um, and another thing that when we are looking at your application, we are taking into account is the activities that you participate in. Um, this is going to vary between students. Um, sometimes there's not as many activities to participate in at the high school level. So you might have a part-time job outside of school, and that's fine too. Sometimes we see students that babysit outside uh, of school, or they have a part-time job at a restaurant. Um, so including all of those activities that you participate in is very important, because it does show that you are a well-rounded student um, outside of school. So again, one of, the thing, one of the pieces I like to recommend with the activity section is sometimes less is more. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking with students, they say, okay, I was a science Olympiad, I did this internship, this internship, I worked at a medical office, um, I had another part-time job, and you'll see a list of 15 different activities, um, and that's fine, but other times you'll see a student that only maybe has like one or two activities, and again, less is sometimes more. I'd rather a student put 100% into those two activities that they participate in than like 50% into the 15 activities that they have. So that's just something to note as well. A lot of times we see students get hung up in that activity section that they need to have you know, a bunch of different activities that they participate in. Um, and then the last two pieces that I'll focus on, I'll talk a little bit more about test scores on the next slide, um, but essay is going to be uh, an, an important piece as well. That's really the time where we get to know you as the student from our perspective. Um, again, I know Ms. Crusay is going to talk a little bit more about that in her piece, um, but the essay is really the, the, the piece where we get to hear your voice as the student. Um, the rest of the application is pretty black and white. We have your transcript, we have your letters of recommendation. Your activity section, we do see it a little bit, but the activities, uh, excuse me, the essay section is really where we get to know you as the student, so that can make you kind of jump off the page a little bit more to us um, as we're reading through your application. All right, so test scores. Now, I know this has kind of changed a lot throughout the last few years. Um, Again, I know I keep saying this, it's going to vary between the schools that you are applying to. So that's why it's really important to do your research when it comes to the colleges. But the nice thing is that with the SUNY system, we're all standard across the board. So if we do something at Albany, most likely Stony Brook is gonna do that as well. Um, same thing with a college like Cortland or Oneonta or Buffalo. We're all standard because we are with SUNY. Now, that being said, um, because of COVID and some shifts throughout the years, we have decided to go test optional. So what test optional means is that it is your option as the student or the student's option if they would like or would not like to submit their SAT or ACT scores. Now, this is really going to differ between the student. So if I'm talking to one student and they say, yeah, it might be a good idea to submit your test scores, I might not say that to the next student because everybody tests differently and everybody has a different profile. So that's why I do think it's really important to talk with your guidance counselor and with your family and with your parents on what is going to be the best decision for you and with your application. Now I won't dive too much uh, too deep into testing because it really can be a complex process. But just know that there are also different um, levels of terminology as it pertains to testing. So one of the things that I'll just mention briefly is something called the test blind policy. Um, test blind means that if you decide as the student to submit your test scores, sometimes the college won't even look at them. Um, it, it does differ between test optional, like test optional, we will look at them if you say, yes, I want my test scores considered. But sometimes if you do submit your test scores to a test blind institution, they won't even look at them. They'll just kind of brush past it and go to um, the other parts of your application. So it really does depend. Um, sometimes it might affect scholarships, sometimes it doesn't. Again, so that's why it's important to kind of do your research, but also talk to the admissions staff at the institution. So if you're interested in New Albany, you can definitely ask me questions about our policies, but if you're interested in some other institutions, definitely talk to them a little bit more and see what their policies are like as it pertains to testing. 
Um, and I'll briefly just touch upon this as well. I know I mentioned that we're going to talk about this more in a couple of minutes. But as I said, the essay is really a great part where you can talk more about yourself as the student. Um, a lot of times, especially recently, I've seen a lot of essays about COVID and the pandemic. And I know that that has affected students very differently. But as we kind of move a further away from the pandemic, I do encourage students to maybe try and take a different lens and a different approach to the essay. Of course, I, you know, not being insensitive that the pandemic affected everybody in various different ways. Um, students had to relocate or they were without clubs and a social life for a while. But just from the college admission side, we have been seeing a lot of essays recently about COVID and about how that's impacted them. So maybe just encouraging you to take a little bit of a different approach, explore some of the different essay prompts that they give you. Um, there are options that you can choose from or you can write about whatever you want. Um, so that's going to be a piece where, again, we, as the admission side, get to learn a little bit more about you as the individual student. Now, just to kind of breeze through um, the last few slides of my portion is just to talk about campus visits. Um, so visiting a college campus is going to be pretty crucial in the college admissions process. Um, but again, this is going to look very different for every student and going to look very different for where you are applying to. If you're applying to schools on the West Coast or pretty far away from here in New York, it might be a little bit unrealistic to visit every single school before you actually apply, and it could be a little bit expensive. So before you, you know, when you're making your list of where you want to apply to colleges, I encourage you to kind of map out where it's going to be realistic for you to apply and, and visit. Um, a lot of times when we have students that come up for tours at New Albany, maybe they're interested in a school like Binghamton, they also are exploring Oneonta, um, New Paltz, for example. So those geographically are all within, you know, a pretty decent radius to New Albany. So they'll kind of make a road trip out of it. So if you have a weekend or a week off of school, maybe in the summer between junior and senior year, that's a pretty popular time that we see students visiting college campuses just to kind of get a feel of what that campus is like. Again, you don't have to visit a campus before you apply. You certainly can just to kind of get a feel if you are interested in actually applying to that school. But a lot of times we see students making their visits to campuses before they decide where they're going to attend. So that's when I'd encourage students to definitely take a tour. But a lot of times colleges will also host open house events in the fall or in the spring. So for this year's senior class that's applying for admission, we are going to be having open houses in March and in April. So usually students decide where they're attending college in May or, or around then. So we'll see a lot of students visit around that time before they make their decisions. Now, there are a number of ways that you can kind of make the most out of your campus visits. But the one thing that I'd recommend is definitely meeting with someone on the admissions team. Um, we're kind of like the operations center to the university. So if you have a question about financial aid or a question about the specific academic program you're interested in, we can usually triage out to those departments and get you the best answers, if not get you the opportunity to meet with those individuals in those departments. So do your research, you know, again, like I said, map out where geographically it's going to be make the most sense for you to visit at once so you can be prepared when it comes time to making your decision and your final decision and lastly um some we have uh you know some frequently asked questions on the uh, admission side um one of the most frequently asked questions i will say is about dual enrollment so a lot of times at the high school level, we see students taking AP level classes, or maybe they're dual enrolled with a local college, like Southern Community College, or St. John's, or New Albany, for example. Um, so the questions are usually, how do those credits usually transfer over to us? Um, again, it's going to depend on the college. 
usually for UAlbany, any AP classes, as long as you receive a three or above on those exams, will transfer over. Um, for any dual enrollment college level classes, usually anything higher than a C will transfer over. So again, that's going to depend on the specific college that you are applying to, but just so you know generally um, that those credits that you earn in high school will likely transfer over to the college level, and that will go towards your credits for graduation. A um, few other things uh, is um, maximizing scholarship opportunities and financial aid. I could do a whole presentation about the differences between scholarships for merit versus financial aid. They can be very complex, but the simplest way I'll put it is that merit scholarships are based off of your academic performance um, and the course rigor that you have in high school. Financial aid is need-based, and that typically goes to the federal government and through the state. What's nice is that at most colleges, if not at all colleges, you can combine the two. So if you get $5,000 worth of merit scholarship because you had a great GPA in high school, but you also get maybe $10,000 of financial aid, you can actually combine that as well. Um, a lot of times people don't also know that there are other scholarship opportunities outside of colleges that you can apply for. So maybe here in high school or in the community or just nationally, there are different scholarships. And there's usually no limit to how many scholarships you can apply for. So they might require like a small essay or a video or something of that sort. So make sure that you're maximizing those scholarship opportunities as well, because even if it's just $100 here and $100 there, it really does add up at the end of the day to lower your cost of attendance as much as possible. So that's my just quick tip there. And lastly, I just want to talk about demonstrated interest. So a lot of times students will ask me, well, if I show interest in a college by going to a college fair or making a visit, will that have an impact on my admission? The answer is kind of complex. It's not really a yes and it's not really a no. But what I will say is that sometimes the more that you get to know the people working behind the scenes, maybe the greater chances are that you can get admitted to the college. So if I form um, a relationship and uh, you know, emailing with a student and, and they're really interested in New Albany and we're emailing back and forth and maybe they come up to visit campus a few times, I get to know them, I get to know their family. Um, maybe they're on the edge though of, of admission, they are kind of on the cusp, then I might have more uh, latitude to say, hey, I really think this student is going to be a good fit here at our institution. I think we should go ahead and admit them. So that's what we call demonstrated interest. Um, a lot of times colleges have kind of done away with making that correlation. But what I can say is that if you do get to know the staff behind the scenes and know your admissions counselor, sometimes we will advocate for you at, because we know that you are interested and know that you may be successful at our institution. And lastly, I just wanna close with a few quick tips. Um, so like I said at the beginning and just you know through my brief remarks here, the college admissions process is very loaded. There's a lot of information. Um, and shortly, if not already, you are gonna start receiving a lot of emails from colleges. So sometimes we have students make their own email address for the college admissions process, and that's a great way to stay organized. Um, but maybe making an Excel spreadsheet or a notebook, just with all of your information that you can keep track of. The more colleges that you apply to, the more emails that you're gonna have. So make sure that you just stay organized throughout the process. This not only goes to the students, but also to the families and the parents as well. Sometimes we'll have two different emails. So we might send a student an email, but we might also send the families and the parents emails as well. So just making sure that you're keeping on top of that. Uh, one of the things also is try not to let the process overwhelm you. I know just probably by me standing here spitting out all this information, your head might be spinning, this might be way too much to kind of comprehend in about 30 minutes. But just know that at the end of the day, as the student and also as the parent, you wind up where you're meant to be, and I'm a firm believer in that. Ms. Crusade and I were just talking about that earlier uh, today, is that at the end of the day, if you make a decision and you go to a college and you find that it's not a great fit, you can always transfer. There's, no, there's nothing 
holding you there. So if you find that you're not a great fit for the school or it's not a great fit for you, you can always transfer to a different school. So don't let the process overwhelm you. Um, as the student, it might be a little overwhelming to be kind of in the driver's seat throughout the process, but just know that that is some um, independence and that you are kind of beginning your journey into adulthood, that you are kind of the driver through the admissions process. And your parents are here to support you and your school staff is here to support you, but it should also be a really exciting process as you begin. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, make sure that you're applying for any and all scholarship opportunities that you can. Like I said, every little dollar adds up. Even if it's just $5 or $10, it does add up at the end of the day. Um, and lastly, I'll just close with uh, staying in touch with your admissions counselor is very important. Like I mentioned earlier, demonstrating interest, showing that you might be a good fit for the college is always going to impress us and make, make your name at the top of our mind. Um, so I've stayed in touch with some of the students that I've worked with throughout the admissions process over the years. So make sure that you're talking with us, you're getting to know us. Um, you don't always have to come visit us wherever we are located, whether that be Albany or another school that you're interested in. A lot of times we do regional events. So we do events here on Long Island or um, you know, we do events for students in New York City as well. So make sure, again, that you're reading those emails as, as they come in because you never know when we might kind of be near you or out to talk a little bit more and get to know you. Um, so I, just in the interest of time, I think we'll just move on to uh, Ms. Rousset's portion, but if anyone has questions at the end, feel free to come chat with me. Happy to talk a little bit more about the process. Um, again, wishing you the best of luck as you kind of begin your journey, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. So thank you so much for having me tonight. Danielle, thank you so much. That was extremely informative. Um, like I said, my name is Danielle Perse. I'm a guidance counselor here at Hampton Base. We have Ms. Ariel Story here with us, another guidance counselor, and Ms. June Levine, that's our third counselor. Okay, to get started. As Danielle had said, we are here to help ease the process. So many parents completely freak out when it comes time to apply to college or to prepare. You'll come to realize it's not as difficult as you thought. We're here every single step of the way. Okay, so planning for college, we're gonna go over a little bit about the college admissions factors, selecting the right college, and a little bit of logistical information. Okay, college admissions factors. High school record, like she said, they look at your transcript, they look at SAT scores, ACT scores, your extracurricular activities, your essay, your letters of recommendation, and of course, your application itself. Okay. If you are not familiar with the transcript, the transcript is basically your child's high school record. Every course they have take, taken throughout their high school career, the grades they received, and the credits that they've earned. It also gives you their unweighted average, their rank, and their weighted average, okay? Um, regions exams are also included on the transcript. The transcript does not include the SAT and ACT scores or the AP scores. Has anyone seen their child's transcript? Okay, if not, have your child come in and ask for a copy of their transcript so you can get a good look at that. Okay, standardized test scores. Test, just some concepts to know. Test registration and score submission. Test optional policies, super score or test prep. I'm not going to get too much into this tonight. We do plan to have junior conferences soon where we will be meeting with you and your child on an individual basis to go over this in more detail. Okay, SATs, the date is arriving for the next SAT exam. It's March 9th, 2024. Registration deadline is February 23rd. We highly advise all juniors to sit for this exam. You do not, I can't stress this enough, you do not want to wait until your senior year to take an SAT exam. You want to at least have one under your belt as a junior, if not two. You don't want it to come time for application season and you're running around saying, oh my God, I have to take an SAT exam. So if anything, I would sign up for the March exam. Give yourself a little bit of a break, see how you do, and then you can prepare maybe for the June exam. So, and again, to the, uh, go back a little bit, you have the SAT, you also have the ACT. 
I always advise my students, take one at ACT and one SAT. Some kids tend to do better on one than the other. If you take an SAT and you say, oh, okay, I did well, let me try the ACT. And you say, wow, I did really well on the ACT. What do you think you should do next? Take another one of the one you did better on. So if you did really well on the ACT, take another ACT and vice versa. Okay, extracurricular activities. As Danielle had mentioned, and I try to tell my students this, it's great to begin your activities freshman year, not all kids do. And they wait till, it's so funny, I have a lot of seniors that waited till senior year, and they joined like five different clubs. That's not what the college wants to see. They want you to get involved, but be passionate about what you do. For example, like she had said, two clubs. You're with it all four years of high school, you take on a leadership position, they're going to see that you're dedicated and committed to that activity. You don't want five different clubs on there, or 10 sports, you're, you're all over the place. They want to see you a little more focused. Um, your resume, we sit down with our students in the beginning of the year, Mr. Eric Ferraro sits down with the students to help them create what's called a resume. Just as if you were applying for a job, you create, again, what's called a resume. On that resume, we include your academic information, your extracurricular activities, community service, that's big. I try to tell kids, try to get in a lot of community service. Don't wait till your senior year. Do it now, because that's definitely a big part of your resume. Athletic information, not all kids join sports. If you join a club, uh, theater club, that's also big. Music, if you're into music. Uh, and then work experience, believe it or not. They like to see that the student is well-rounded, as Danielle said, and they can handle both working outside of school, clubs, and academics. Okay. The college essay. This is where a lot of kids struggle. And this is where a lot of kids wait till last minute to apply because they're not happy with their college essay. One thing I can say to you is please encourage your children to start that essay over the summer. Just get together some thoughts, some ideas, put it on paper, start to prepare. You want to be honest and be yourself. Don't pretend to be someone else. Don't write as if you feel they, they want to see you a certain way. You, you be who you are, that's what they want to see. Strive for quality and not quantity. Answer the questions and use clear writing, revise and edit. All of our seniors take a course called Writing and Research, the first half of their senior year, where they'll be working with the students to refine their college essay. Okay, so they have the help of their English teacher, they have, have the help from their guidance counselor. Okay, I'm going to pass the mic to Mrs. Sori. So we're talking about the college essay. These are the Common App essay prompts. Um, your application is your story um, as a student, but the essay is gonna be your story as an individual. So these prompts, I recommend using one of them. They do allow you to do your own um, essay based on what you want to write about. But when you use these prompts, there's more of a guide. So that's what I recommend. And we'll talk a lot more about this during, during the junior meeting. Um, we also have links to a lot of these things. Um, there'll be a QR code towards, towards the end of the presentation. Um, okay, so this is admissions factor, letters of recommendation. We recommend each student having two academic letters of recommendation from a teacher um, that can speak to your abilities and involvement in the classroom. Uh, you want to ask a teacher that um, has to do with the major that you're applying to. So if you're going to go to college with a pre-med track, you may want to ask a bio teacher if you plan on um, majoring in the bio field. Okay. Your guidance counselor will give you a letter of recommendation, so it'll be two plus us. Um, and then you may want to consider asking a teacher that, you know, you may have struggled in the course, but then you ended up succeeding towards the end. Um, it shows that you really tried and it can um, show how you persevered through that class. And then all your letters are confidential and waive your rights. So that means you cannot see your letters of recommendation. All right, so this is selecting the right college, college visits. I'll spoke a little bit about that with SUNY Albany. Um, there's a couple things to consider, and again, we'll talk about this during the junior meeting, um, the geographic location. So if you want to be somewhere warm, you're not going to apply to somewhere cold. Um, you want to take the weather into consideration. You want to visit the dorm rooms. 
eat on campus. You want to see how the food is and how students are living their life on campus. And you want to look at the athletics and social activities to make sure they align with what you want to do in college. Um, Post-visit, you can write a summary so that way you can keep organized when you are applying to these schools. Um, and then you can write a thank you note or email to um, the person that's giving you that tour. Selecting the right college, the answers, and doing your homework. You want to do your research when you're applying to these schools. If you want to go into, let's say, theater, you're not going to apply to a school that doesn't have theater at their school. So you want to look at the major and minor options when you're looking at these schools, the size and geographic location, um, the housing options, off-campus, on-campus options, the athletic programs if you're looking at doing sports, costs and financial aid, so that's a big one. Um, you want to talk as a family to see what you can afford and what the options are for your student. Um, and then the internship and study abroad programs at that school. Any questions so far? I'd like to kind of... Alright, so part three, this is the logic, logistical information, college search tools, financial aid and resources. So again, we'll have a QR code, you can take a picture of that towards the end, that'll have that information. All right, so we use um, Naviance and College Board when it comes to looking at different colleges, what they offer at these schools. During your junior meeting, we're gonna be using a lot of Naviance. On Naviance, it's a great tool. You can use it for a lot of different purposes. For us, we'll be hopefully able to use it um, to match you with the school based on an SAT score um, and your GPA, which would be really nice because then you can see where you lie amongst the schools that you're applying. And then the College Board is also a good tool. You can look up certain schools on there, what they're asking for the SAT um, and their graduation rate, as well as their acceptance rates on there, too. This is for financial aid. Um, there's the FAFSA, uh, the federal application for financial aid. Uh, the CSS profile is what a lot of private schools use for their financial aid process. Um, you want to make sure on the college website when the deadlines are because um, each school has a different deadline for the CSS profile. And then certain, there's scholarships. There's national, there's college board scholarships. There's a lot of local scholarships in Hampton Bays as well. So you want to keep updated in guidance. You want to be checking your email. I know a lot of students don't check their email, but you may be missing a lot of opportunity for money um, by not checking. And this is the QR code where you can get the college planning guide for Hampton Bays. If you want to take a picture of that, it'll send you to the link of a folder with um, different, like, other links that we have on this presentation. Okay? I'll give a moment for people to take a picture. Good to go. going through this way more in depth during your junior meeting. You'll get a packet um, with all the information. We'll be going through it um, personalized for each student. All right. Any questions for Danielle? Wow, we would like to Okay. All right. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at our junior conferences.